What is the background to the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan and why did we need it? Right, the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan has been developed from the uh, plan that the Christchurch City Council developed. So that was a draft recovery plan and that was required under the legislation. So that's the CERA Act, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act. So the only uh, recovery plan that's required by the legislation was one that related to uh, what the Act calls the CBD, which uh, most people in Christchurch call the four avenues and I call them five avenues because there are actually five avenues when you put Deans, Harper, Beeley, Fitzgerald, Morehouse Avenue. So that's the area that the plan had to relate to. It obviously includes Hagley Park. The Christchurch City Council was required under the legislation to develop the plan. It did so in conjunction with uh, Naitahu, with the um, with ECAN and with SERA, but also with a great deal of input from the local community. So the Share an Idea uh, was one of well, it's one of the best communication um, efforts ever done by a local authority with its people. And from that, they developed the draft plan, which uh, ended up being handed over to the Minister on the 21st of December last year. The Minister uh, has a role under the Act of approving that plan, but he can also look at it, he could have withdrawn it and said, well, don't need it at all, and withdraw parts of it, or he can make changes to it. And uh, one of the things that happened once the Minister got it was then it was advertised for written comment. A lot of written comment came in saying that really that people wanted more certainty about where things like the anchor projects, where the convention centre was going to go, where we were going to have a stadium, where was that going to go, what sort of timelines. Uh, so the Minister then set up uh, within SERA the Christchurch Central uh, Development Unit and asked, <coughs> gave us 100 days basically to try and finalise the plan and that was done with the cons Blueprint Consortium. So they were looking at mainly the anchor projects but also the gaps in between to try and work out where we'd put anchor projects, how people would uh, link and relate between the anchor projects, which ones would uh, catalyse development. They've come up with the with a blueprint which includes a blueprint plan about where all the locations are. That then had to be fed into the recovery plan document itself. Uh, so the recovery plan document uh, picks up on what the council provided but adds in a whole lot more detail because of the assessments done by the blueprint team. And that will be the document. Now the Act also allows the recovery plan to direct changes to uh, to other instruments, which includes the district plan that the council has to do under the uh, Resource Management Act, and it is the district plan that has the rules and we, well, the rules that relate to what you can and can't build within the city. So it's that part of the recovery plan that we've been mainly dealing with is trying to get the policy objectives, policies, and rules uh, resolved so that the document that is the recovery plan and the uh, vision that is included in it can be given effect to through the Resource Management Act. Uh, it's an interesting process because normally to change a district plan it takes a huge effort. You can't just do it by a direction. And it's that sort of power that's in the CERA Act which has made a huge difference to how development happens within, well it's going to happen within the Greater Christchurch area. Uh, the CERA Act does give the Minister and the Chief Executive of CERA some pretty amazing powers. Uh, and so the development that you you would expect development is going to happen a lot quicker here than what it would normally do under, under our normal process, uh, under the process of uh, having hearings, going to the environment court, appeal process, all that sort of stuff. But on top of that, of course, we still have our normal legal um, controls as well. So it's sort of a mixture a real checks and balance mixture of the Minister being given a great deal of power to go ahead and do things, but always being in mind that the courts can review what happens if it is necessary. Um, so why do we need the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan? I think we need it because we needed a, a plan about how the city is going to develop. Uh, we could have just left everything to be done by the owners of the properties in a piecemeal way, but there are actually thousands of properties uh, within the central city, even though it's not that huge area. Uh, very small 
uh, sections in some cases, and just trying to de develop them in a consecutive way so you can actually get life back into the city uh, just needs some overview, and that's what the recovery plan is going to do and provide that well, blueprint or guideline or however you want to call it. If I'm a developer in the central city, what are the key changes that are going to affect me? Well, what we've done is look, as far as the changes to the district plan, which are probably the most important, but uh, what we've done is rezone, looked at the zonings of the that the council had. So the council had a central city zoning, but it was a covered a very large area, about 90, 90. 92 hectares. So we've managed to confine the central city business zone into just at the core. So it's basically around with the cathedral square is that sort of business area, confined by the Avon River, but also confined by what um, the blueprint team's called the frame. So we're setting up. Uh, a control, an area both to the east and the south of the city which will uh, be open space and that will have the effect of confining the, where the main development is. Uh, so if you are a developer in that central city then the rules in the district plan will actually allow you to use it for most purposes all the way from retail, commercial, hospitality, residential uh, office blocks, that sort of normal stuff that you'd expect to see in a central city. Uh, but we have imposed a few rules, uh, things like height restraints, uh, some urban design controls, but what we have attempted to do is simplify the rules as much as possible so that they are easy to, for people to follow. Uh, if you can't comply with the rule, then the activity becomes what is known as a restricted discretionary activity. Uh, a restricted discretionary activity which is not going to be notified. So the only people that will be involved in the hearing are the developer and the council make it, uh, making a decision about whether you can go ahead and what conditions will be imposed. That should speed up quite, a, quite considerably the whole uh, resource consent process. So for a developer within the core of the central city we think that actually things are going to be a lot easier develop and it'll be a lot quicker. Developers in the central city I presume will uh, find that the new approach uh, reduces their costs to develop projects. We would certainly expect so because time usually equals costs for developers and what we're endeavouring to do is to set up a regime that's a lot more uh, straightforward, a lot easier to navigate through and which doesn't have some of the um, extensive public hearing type costs that are often involved in consenting. For Christchurch City Council the previous plan was um, quite complicated, it had a lot of layers of regulation in it and that wasn't something that was peculiar just to Christchurch City, that's happened with a lot of district plans up and down the country where over the years new rules get added and added and eventually you end up with something that's quite difficult to get through and quite difficult to navigate. What we've had the opportunity to do here is to establish a whole new zone, so we've drafted provisions for a new central city business zone and also a new central city mixed use zone. And what that allows us to do is set out really clearly the types of activities that we want to see in that business area and then the types of activities that are more suited to the mixed use area, uh, which is further out from the square. We've set that up in a way that you should be able to open the plan, look down and see exactly what's permitted and what the standards are for development. So, if you're the type of activity that we want to see in that business zone and you meet the development parameters, so you're within the height, um, you've got your car parking tucked around the back of your building, those sorts of things, then you'll be permitted. The only thing that you would need to do in the core is basically get a tick off, get a consent about your urban design and that just allows the consent authority to have a look at how your building integrates with its surrounding context. We've set up a new process for that, which is a, a streamlined process, a five-day turnaround. And so you should be able to get that tick if you, if you meet all those standards very quickly. And with that sort of fast-track approach, then cost is definitely reduced. Why were these height restrictions in the new central city imposed? Building heights are a bit of a vexed issue, and they have been quite uh, emotive, I guess, over the past year. 
the reality is that the height of a building does have environmental effects. Um, if you have very tall buildings, you do get shading, you do get wind tunnelling that, that occurs as a result, and that reduces the experience for people at, ground, at the ground level. What we've tried to do is to look at that. We want to create a central city that people enjoy being in, that they want to walk around, that has sun, um, that they can have a good experience in. But we're also very mindful that height restrictions have an effect on yield and that's a matter that the business community are, are concerned about. And so there's been a lot of economic modelling done, there's been a lot of capacity analysis done and that's been used together with the urban design considerations to inform those new height limits. What other development standards will be applied? There are development standards in the business zone that are around, again, how these buildings look and what experience is created for people at the ground floor. So there are development standards about tucking your car parking in at the back of your building, maybe underneath your building or within your building but out of view. Uh, and that's again to create a situation where we don't have cars and, and um, large areas of car parking at grade uh, in that important central city area. There are also rules about building right up to the street, building right across your, um, your, the width of your site, so that again we're creating this great experience at that ground level for people to wander around and, and have an attractive central city that they really enjoy being in. Um, there are also uh, some considerations around urban design, as I said, around context um, and how your building fits into your context. But there's not a lot. To be entirely frank, there are not a lot of development standards. Once you can be clear about the types of activities that you want, you don't need to write a lot of rules necessarily to constrain those types of activities. Can you explain what's meant by the frame? The frame is the area to the east of the city and to the south of the city and there's a small part to the north across the um, Avon River. Uh, what that is intended to do is constrain the constrain the area which is between the core and the other zones and it will to a certain extent soak up some of the land that is at the moment probably excess to requirements although the intention is that we also have the underlying zoning sitting under it so under the uh, east frame there will still be a business zoning and under the south frame it's a mixed use zoning. What that does mean is that those areas can still be developed. It's uh, sort of a potential development there as the city grows. If you need more space there is some area there. But it's also going to be used as a pleasant environment so it's uh, the intention is to landscape all of that area. In the south frame it will be more campus style development and it's hoped that there will be health facilities, education type facilities, uh, lots of green space in between those buildings. Uh, in the east frame, because it's going to be actually next to the stadium, in the south bit of the east frame it will be a fan zone area, uh, so for the spillover from the stadium to and from, and right next to the area where we would expect a hospitality, bars, precinct area. In the north part of the east frame there's an intention to have a children's playground, a large children's playground. Uh, in between that there's going to be some development, there's a potential for residential development in there and it should be a really lovely place to be living because it's going to have this whole park-like environment uh, around it. And there will be some buildings that are there, like the Christchurch Club building is still there and that will, um, as a historic building, is actually really important and that will continue to be there. There's some other buildings that are there that may also uh, stay. What's going to happen to people who own land or businesses? on the area that's going to be designated as the frame? Well, as with all designations, what we've set up is the requiring authority, so that's the Minister for uh, Canterbury Earthquake Recovery. So he is specified in the district plan as the requiring authority. What that means is that he can control what happens on those spaces. So designations have two uh, benefits for the requiring authority. First, they mean that people that own that land can't do things on that land until they have the approval of the requiring authority. Uh, so, for example, if, we, if they were proposing a temporary development which was only going to be in place for, for a short period of time, then the Minister might be very happy for that to go ahead while the d development of the uh, whole frame or the 
convention centre or any of the other spaces that have been designated uh, goes ahead. The other advantage of a designation is that it actually means that the rules in the district plan don't apply and you can just build so the convention centre can be built as a convention centre without having to comply necessarily with all the underlying rules uh, which may be important for a height in particular. But as far as the owners are concerned, what a designation does do is say that this land is actually required for another purpose and at some stage we are going to be interested in acquiring that land. Now the intention is to try and acquire all land that is required for any of these projects um, voluntarily and landowners are going to be contacted as soon as possible uh, that we are interested in purchasing their land. For a number of the properties, especially in the south zone and in the east, south frame and east frame, there's actually a lot of black, uh, vacant space there at the moment where buildings have already been demolished. Uh, so hoping that those landowners will be interested in just selling the land uh, and moving on and being able to redevelop elsewhere within the city. Uh, for those people that have don't wish to sell, um, the end result is that we do have some pretty interesting compulsory acquisition powers under our legislation. They are based on the Public Works Act compulsory acquisition powers, but they are actually uh, more effective. And that again goes back to this whole thing that the CERA Act does have some very strong powers to enable recovery to proceed. Uh, we can acquire the land without having agreed to the compensation and that's the normal hold up with the Public Works Act is that you have to go through a whole process to agree how much compensation is going to be paid for the land. Under the Sarah Act we can acquire the land and it is the Crowns and the Crown can develop it and the discussions about compensation can continue afterwards including going to the court so the Minister's decision about what the compensation is is not the last word, it can be appealed. But yes, if you're in the de if you're in an area that's designated, uh, the uh, message is well. We're very interested in buying your land off you. Do the new rules apply to existing use rights? Um, existing use rights is a term that um, quite often gets confused. In terms of your business, if you've got a business that's uh, operating in the central city and you want to keep doing that, then that's fine. If you're there lawfully and you've got a consent to do that, then you can continue to operate under that consent. If you want to do something new, then you do need to comply with the new zone provisions and the new development standards. There was a proposition put forward by Christchurch City Council in their draft which was to insert a rule in the district plan that allowed you to rebuild to earthquake levels um, within four years uh, after the earthquakes. And so if you had a, a 17 storey building then you could reinstate that under that provision. That provision hasn't been carried through. Um, there are, as I said, some environmental effects of having those very tall buildings and it's not the intention that people should be able to necessarily bypass the new development standards. However, there is a provision in the Resource Management Act that entitles you to ask the council to issue an existing use certificate and if you can meet those statutory tests then you may be able to achieve that. How do the rules affect residential development in the new central city? Residential development is a critical part of the recovery plan and residential activity is enabled in every zone throughout the central city. Uh, within the business zones, within the mixed use zones, uh, residential activity is permitted and what we've done is to uh, look at some new provisions that actually make residential activity even more attractive in those areas by protecting amenity. Uh, within the four living zones, um, obviously that residential is the predominant activity and again we've looked at those provisions uh, there is probably a post 100 day project around rationalising some of those zones there's quite a lot of zoning in there and lots of um, quite subtle differences between zones uh, which could probably be rationalised but at the moment they provide well for, uh, for urban um, development in that area and we are satisfied that there are lots of opportunities and really good opportunities for residential living within the four avenues. Of course that will be hugely enhanced by some of the amenity that's going in, the redevelopment of the Avon River, the inclusion of the frame in those new green spaces, um, new anchor projects, the stadium, the new metropolitan sports facility. 
all of those things will be great attractors for people in terms of looking at inner city living. Do the rules apply outside the four or five avenues? No, they don't. Um, the rules that uh, have been changed and the new ones that are put in place in the district plan are all related to the area within those avenues. In summary, the whole aim of this project has been to create certainty and confidence for the development community. By locating the anchor projects, by having certainty about where things are going to be located and having a really clear and easy to navigate regulatory framework, we've set up the situation where developers can be very certain about what they can do, very certain about when and how they can do it and can get through those hoops really quickly. And that's what it's all about because the plan is that we want to rebuild the city as quickly as we can.